Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's briefing that EESI is very proud to bring you in conjunction with NASIO, the National Association of State Energy uh, Officials. Oh, wait just a second here. Okay. Today's briefing is the second in a series that we are doing with NASIO to really look at how we can build and maintain um, more secure and resilient infrastructure. As we know, states and localities are critical to the whole country's economy and in terms of maintaining and looking after in terms of, of building our country's infrastructure. And I hope that those of you who were not able to join us in our briefing on Friday, and that briefing is online, but that briefing uh, was the first in our series on infrastructure. And that, that briefing really looked at the state of infrastructure across the country, looking at 17 different categories of infrastructure. And I think that is one of the things that is always amazing is in terms of how much and how many different systems of infrastructure we all depend upon in this country. And indeed, that the relationships be among the federal, state, and local governments are immense, um, are very inextricably intertwined, and really depend upon everyone understanding those relationships and working together so that we can make our country run and so our economy can prosper. So today's briefing is going to be taking a special look at the whole area of energy emergency preparedness, a critical federal, state, and private sector partnership. Because dealing with infrastructure, dealing with energy emergency preparedness involves everybody from all of these different sectors. And we're going to hear firsthand today from state energy officials with regard to this important role. And I think it's really important to have this chance to hear directly from directors of state energy offices. If you have not been aware of or working with the states and with their uh, state energy uh, directors and their staffs, now is an important time to begin those relationships as they play an immensely critical role. And over and over again, I am amazed at the breadth of the issues in which they are engaged and also at the great ingenuity and innovation that you find in so many of the offices and in terms of how much they are able to leverage and to be a catalyst in terms of making so many things happen that are important to their states. And they do this with an amazingly small amount of resources, which they leverage very, very effectively. So we will start off our discussion this afternoon with David Terry, who is the executive director of the National Association of State Energy Officials of NASIO. David is the longtime director there. He has been involved with, with working at NASIO since 1996. Uh, and of course, in that capacity, he has been involved with an enormous range of issues that state energy uh, officials are required to undertake because they serve uh, as an important adjunct to their governor's off, er, cabinet. And David also, in the course of his work, has been involved with a number of gubernatorial coalitions, particularly in terms of biofuels and wind energy. And he also is executive director of ACERTI, which is the National Association of State Energy and Technology Research Institutions. And I am also very proud to say that David serves on EESI's Board of Directors. David. Thank you, Carol, and thanks uh, everybody for joining us uh, here today and via webcast. 
Um, as Carol mentioned, uh, NASIO uh, represents the 56 state and territory energy offices across the country. Uh, as with all things at the state level, there's a little variation from state to state and region to region and place to place. Uh, but as a, a general matter, I wanted to, to, to give you a sense of uh, a little bit of NASIO's work just briefly and more importantly what the state energy offices are doing um, and, and we'll move on to uh, our state presenters today. Uh, NASIO was really uh, formed at, at nearly the same time that many of the states were going through uh, the oil uh, embargo of the late 70s and some of the oil uh, stresses this country went through in that time frame. And at the time, energy emergencies were generally handled at the state level. Uh, so it's always been a component of what our organization is about and a component of what most of the energy offices are involved with, but they do many other things. If you think, if you're not familiar with the state structure of energy policy versus regulation and other activities, Activities. Um, the energy offices, the energy directors are representing uh, really the broad energy activities at the state level uh, from an economic development perspective, whether it's advancing uh, conventional fuels, renewable fuels, efficiency, uh, transportation solutions, um, workforce development, certainly energy emergencies, what we're talking about today, uh, energy efficiency in buildings, uh, but most importantly responding to the governors and the, and the citizens in their state and their desire to promote uh, a good economic economic development, sound use of energy resources in their own state, um, and, uh, and delivering really on the priorities uh, that their uh, governors and legislatures set. Uh, NASIO has uh, structured uh, around committees that address all of these areas. You can find those online. Um, I won't go through them today except to say that we address, much as the energy offices do, virtually every energy sector uh, and end use sector. And so uh, we're focusing today on a topic that really crosses many of those, uh, but hopefully uh, you'll, you'll have time to take a look at the offices in the various states and what they're doing um, and learn a little bit more. I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense uh, focused on energy emergencies or energy assurance as we sometimes call it, uh, what it's about and uh, why it should matter to all of you. Uh, this is an issue that's been around for many years. It, as I mentioned, it began with a lot of oil stresses uh, some 30 years ago, uh, but it's evolved to include all hazards. So when you think of hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, uh, certainly any kind of natural disaster uh, can cause disruptions in energy supplies. There are accidents that happen from time to time. There are other kinds of disruptions, certainly um, uh, uh, terrorist or cyber activity. We saw a round of cyber activity this weekend that hopefully uh, does not impact uh, the energy sector in a serious way, although that is still unraveling. But it's a good uh, wake-up call to the number of areas that the energy infrastructure um, is at risk and how interdependent it is with one another. I think we often think, if you're not familiar with this space, about uh, the electric grid and the importance that that has. Our electric utilities, both investor-owned and consumer-owned, do an amazing job of keeping the lights on. Uh, there's a long history of collaboration among the private sector uh, in doing that. Uh, same is true uh, on the liquid fuel side, petroleum products, jet fuel, diesel fuel, gasoline, but it is a much different area. It's uh, generally speaking not a regulated area, so there's a little bit less attention to it. Uh, it's a much more complicated sector in terms of how, it's, uh, how energy is produced and distributed. The variety of private sector players involved in that process are much larger. So when there is a disaster or an emergency of some kind, it's often on the liquid fuel side that uh, the energy offices engage in particular just because because that is more difficult uh, to address. And again, the private sector does an amazing job of making all of this run. So it's just a little bit of a glimpse of what uh, you'll hear today. Uh, I'm not gonna go on uh, much more about that, but I do wanna note um, a couple of important pieces of this. This is a very interdependent function. Um, uh, quite frankly, the states, in, an, in a real emergency, the states cannot do this on their own. Local governments cannot do this on their own. The federal government cannot do this on, on its own, nor can the private sector. It is an interdependent function. It requires contributions from each. We have, in my career, uh, gone through a period of about a dozen years with very little federal apparatus and a limited state apparatus. That is not a good outcome. In the last dozen years, we've had a remarkable partnership with the Department of Energy and other federal agencies, remarkable commitment from the states, the energy offices, the utility commissions, uh, and the private sector to do a better job in this space than we have. And you'll hear a lot about that uh, today. Uh, the Department of Energy's Office of Electricity um, is largely responsible for the energy emergency support function 12, ESF 12 at the federal level. They interact with 
with the states on this issue, and also the Office of Efficiency and Renewable Energy, uh, which houses the U.S. State Energy Program. A uh, portion of those funds the states typically allocate toward energy emergency preparedness and response. So this is really a, a cross-cutting activity and, again, plays both sides of this issue, both the emergency preparedness side and mitigation. The better job we do on constructing buildings in a resilient way and an efficient manner, uh, having more distributed generation fuels, more distributed or more uh, diverse transportation fuels, uh, the more resilient we are. Uh, so just a, a couple of important uh, things to keep in mind as you hear from our presenters. And lastly, uh, as I mentioned, the U.S. State Energy Program is a key component of how many of the states uh, keep these activities alive and, and hopefully uh, have uh, exercises and planning in place um, uh, to respond to emergencies and to mitigate uh, before they happen. Uh, the mitigation side is particularly important. That's funded currently at $50 million a year by Congress through formula funding that goes to the Department of Energy. NASIO has requested $70 million uh, for the coming fiscal year, particularly because of the cybersecurity threat, which we are all working to get our hands around, um, and is an uh, incredibly serious one. And again, this is an interdependent function. So with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Carol so we can hear from our state speakers. And uh, thank you all for coming, and thank ESI for pulling together such a great event. Uh, David will have to leave early uh, uh, because of a family medical issue, so don't be surprised if you see him um, uh, walk out. Um, and I can't see it. <laughs> a, a very important announcement. There are more lunches on the way. So anyway. <laughs> uh, so now I would like to turn to our first presenter. And uh, one of the things today that we also were hoping to accomplish um, was to have uh, state energy directors uh, covering different swaths of the country. So we have someone from, from Florida, from the east, uh, someone from the Great Plains, and we have someone from, uh, from the west coast. And we hope uh, over the ensuing months to bring you more perspective and more voices from more uh, officials across the country as well. And we will first hear from Kelly Smith Burke, who is the director of the Florida Energy Office. Now, in Florida, the Energy Office is part of the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And Kelly brings to this work um, a lot of experience in, in uh, where she is responsible for the development of energy policy programs for the state, as well as promoting the use of renewable energy and all sorts of energy efficient technologies and their applications. She also is responsible for supervision and for oversight of policy development program and grant design, as well as tracking all sorts of legislation at state and federal level. Prior to her work with the Office of Energy, she was part of Florida's Department of Environmental Protection, where she was, uh, as part of her role there, she was part of the gover governor's action team on energy and climate change, where she was involved with looking at services, managing transportation and land use uh, uh, technologies. And through all of this, therefore, it meant that she had to really take a look holistically, understand kind of all of these systems, and I think all of which very much prepared her for this important work that she serves as director of the Florida Energy Office. Kelly? Well, thank you. Okay. Um, so as was said, the Office of Energy in Florida is located in the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. I will tell you we are the only energy office in the United States that is in our Department of Agriculture. So just want to throw that out there for your knowledge. Um, but the Office of Energy serves multiple functions and responsibilities in the state. Um, we are legislatively designated as the State Energy Policy Development Office. Um, we evaluate energy-related studies. Oh, I'm sorry. 
studies analysis and we receive stakeholder input. We promote and advocate for the development and use of renewable energy resources and energy efficiency technologies. We also use any available state and federal funding to develop and manage energy efficiency, renewable energy, and energy education programs. Uh, we are also we also produce an annual report um, out of our office, which talks about the energy use within the state, as well as updates on what the energy office is doing um, programmatic wise, and that's available um, on our website. And we also serve as the state clearinghouse for all energy information. Um, so legislatively, that's what we are designated to do. But as it relates to emergency support functions, ESF 12 fuels, we actually serve as the support team. Um, for that particular function. And ESF 12 Fuels, if you don't know, involves close coordination with the private sector providers of transportation fuels such as propane, diesel fuel, and gasoline to acquire that fuel should it be needed um, within an emergency situation. Um, our Florida Division of Emergency Management has primary responsibility to monitor and coordinate with the private sector to ensure adequate supplies are available. Um, and as I said, we serve as the support function. So once um, we are activated, our staff goes in normally for about four hour shifts um, and helps with the coordination of those fuels. Um, one thing I will say about Florida, which is pretty unique, is that all of our transportation fuels come in through our ports. Um, very little comes in through um, railway or uh, trucks. It's mostly all through our ports. So when we have an issue or a disaster such as a hurricane that is coming through, all of our ports will close for safety precautions. And what that means is that the tankers who are in bringing in our fuel have to remain out in the ocean until the ports reopen in order to deliver that fuel. Any fuel that's on site at the ports at the time of closure is stuck there. We can't get on to get the fuel until the port is deemed safe and reopened. Um, so that creates an issue, as you can imagine, within our state as far as moving transportation fuels around. Um, so we do coordinate a lot with, um, uh, we do have an emergency fuels coordinator um, who guarantees gas and diesel delivery, and that is an out-of-state entity that we use in order to make sure that we still have fuel coming into the state. Um, but I just wanted to, to put that out there because I think a lot of people don't think about the fact of when all of your transportation fuels are imported, what that means when all those ports close. Um, and we did have an issue with Hurricane Matthew when one of our ports closed, Port Everglades. Um, and so we were monitoring those levels. Fortunately, the port did not sustain any damage and was able to open relatively quickly. So during Hurricane Matthew of this past hurricane season, we didn't experience any fuel shortages. But one of the things that we also do at ESF 12 is that we make sure um, that there's delivery of gas or propane to critical stations along the evacuation route, as well as to critical entities such as hospitals, um, police, fire trucks, and utility trucks as they're working to um, restore power should it be lost. There's another part of ESF 12, and that's the energy part. Um, the ESF 12 energy coordination um, works with the electric and national, natural gas utilities in the state to ensure the integrity of the power supply systems are main I'm sorry, are maintained during emergency situations. Um, our Public Service Commission is responsible for ESF 12, um, and they provide updates on restoration. They provide and help facilitate um, restoration of power to high priority buildings um, and equipment, that's such as hospitals, um, police stations, fire stations, that type of thing. Um, and they help alleviate some of the bureaucratic impediments that might happen as you are trying to restore power, such as facilitating waivers and law enforcement escorts um, should they be needed for utility vehicles as they are trying to restore power. Um, ESF 12 Energy, the Public Service Commission, also works not only with our investor-owned utilities, but also with our municipal utilities and our cooperatives that might be impacted um, from a natural disaster situation. Um, one of the private parts of this partnership as it relates to emergency management is the utility preparation. So our utilities, and we have five investor-owned private utilities that operate in the state, and they um, 
hold their own yearly hurricane preparedness workshops. Um, and it's in conjunction with the Florida Public Service Commission. And in these workshops, they address hardening and preparation. So they look and inspect the distribution lines and the structure um, of the grid within the state. They look at flood mitigation and they look at smart grid infrastructure. They also inspect the poles to make sure um, that they are in good condition or as appropriate can be replaced with steel or concrete. We still have a lot of wooden poles um, within the state of Florida. And so when a system comes through, those are more likely to be knocked down or destroyed than something of steel or concrete. And they also discuss to make sure that communications issues are resolved prior to an emergency situation. I know with Hurricane Matthew, FPL was Florida Power and Light, which is one of our, which is our largest investor in utility. They were very good at providing updates to the public of where they were, what outages had been resolved, um, and how long they thought outages would last. <clears throat> Um, also, in our preparation, utilities have cooperative agreements um, with other utilities within the state and with out of, outside of the state. This becomes vitally important um, as we are working to restore power. I can tell you with Hurricane Hermine, who was our first hurricane in 10 years in the state, um, which happened in September through the Panhandle, um, a lot of the cooperatives received help um, from utilities and cooperatives in Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, who came down to help restore power. And there's also a cooperative agreement where we will also return that favor. So in Superstorm Sandy, um, a lot of the utilities, especially Florida Power and Light, sent utility vehicles and servicemen up to um, the Northeast in, help, in order to help them restore power. And that's critical as you are trying to get the power back on as quickly as possible because citizens do not like to be without power <laughs> longer than they have to. Um, but there are some issues with this as far as um, municipalities and contracts with IOUs and cooperatives and contract with IOUs that we realized after the storms um, last year in Florida that we're working on to try to, to ease those restrictions and those burdens as they create those cooperative agreements. One of the ways that we also address um, emergency preparedness is through resiliency. So in the early 90s, uh, Florida was devastated by a lot of natural disasters, including Hurricane Andrew. Um, and after Hurricane Andrew, uh, we started looking at our building code system within the state. And a study was conducted, and they realized that code adaptation and enforcement was inconsistent across the state. And that local codes that we once thought were strong turned out to be not strong when tested by a major hurricane. And these weaknesses resulted in loss of life, um, economic devastation, and statewide property insurance consequences. So to put this, um, to, just to give you some numbers, Hurricane Andrew destroyed 28,000 homes and caused damage to 106,000 homes. It resulted in $26.5 billion in damage. That's in 1992 dollars. If that same storm was to happen this year, it would have caused approximately $46 billion. And to put it even in further context, the state of Florida's entire budget for this year was $83 billion. So it was almost half of what our state budget would be should a natural disaster like that occur. So in response to what um, that study found uh, Florida re reformed our building code system to provide optimal standards for protection, um, placing emphasis on uniformity and accountability. So in 1998, the Florida Building Commission was established. Um, as of now, the Florida Building Commission has 27 members from across all the stakeholders areas related to building codes or building um, officials throughout the state. My office has a seat on the building commission. Um, we were just confirmed, so we serve there um, as part of the group to make sure that the codes uh, look at energy efficiency and respond to that and make sure that it's part of our code. Um, since 2001, the Florida Building Code is updated every three years. Um, we use the international building codes as our base, and then we go in and we modify it based upon um, what floor is Florida specific. Um, we strengthen it in a lot of ways to address the issues that we have in the state that a state of, let's say, even Georgia or Alabama, our neighbors to the north, would not have. Um, so we just want to make sure that it's, it's as strong as it can be. 
Um, unlike many states, we require state licensure for building code enforcement, and we have our own product approval program, as well as a strong education and training code for building code enforcers. And we do that because our code cycle is every three years. We want to make sure that our building officials and our code enforcement, and as well as our construction folks, understand what those new codes are. Um, so right now we have the fifth edition code. We are about to adopt the sixth edition, so that'll take effect um, December 30th. 31st of this year. So starting next year, we'll start training programs for all those involved in the building sector to make sure that they understand what those new code modifications are so that it's an easier transition as they go to build to a higher standard. But even though we have a high standard, we still have some statewide specific codes that we have to include. And this is more, um, we have an extra layer of coding for building codes for three counties within the state, um, Dade, Broward, and Collier County. They are um, at the very bottom of Florida where Miami, Naples are. Um, and the reason that we have this is because the way storms normally come across our state, they get the highest uh, wind velocity in those. So we add an extra layer of protection to make sure that those codes are built to withstand um, 100 plus mile an hour winds. Um, so a lot of that is uh, making sure exterior glass doors and windows are shatterproof, uh, making sure that there's water resistance, exterior walls um, to the building envelope uh, because of flooding that could occur where they sit sea level wise, they're, they're below it. Um, we also make sure that um, residential design enhancement for wind speeds, wind speeds are above 100 miles an hour. Um, so there's a stricter layer of code that happens in those three counties just to ensure that they are resilient against those high winds. Um, one of the other programs that we did in order um, to make use of some of our uh, shelters in a hurricane was that we created the SunSmart Schools e-shelter program. And what this is is that schools that also act as um, hurricane shelters, we provided a grant, um, and this whole grant program is about $10 million, to provide a 10 kilowatt PV system with battery backup to the school. Um, what it did was it does system offset of electricity use for the school. We also included a curriculum um, for teachers so that they could teach their students about the solar panels, um, the way that the system worked, they could monitor the usage and they could see it so they could understand how a solar panel impacts um, their school. But it also provided for a backup system, like we said, in case the power went out in a storm, um, this 10 kilowatt system could normally run a gymnasium or a cafeteria um, for a few hours in order to make sure that they still had um, power before the utilities could restore it. Um, we ended up installing 106 systems. That was with our funding as well as um, some of our investor-owned utilities like the program. They invested another $900,000, so we were able to do another 30 schools. Um, but this resulted in over one megawatt of capacity and the systems produce 13 megawatts annually. Um, so that's been a really great program, and I know like a lot of the schools are, are proud that they have the solar systems. My son's school had one, and I remember when I dropped him off at school, he was very excited to point it out to me. Um, but again, it added an education component to it so that our kids could learn more about how renewable energy impacts them right there where they're learning and going to school. Even though we've been talking about hurricanes, our state still faces other natural disasters. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but right now, we say the state of Florida is on fire. Um, we have about 205 active wildfires, and it covers 28,000 plus acres um, within the state of Florida. Uh, and right now, uh, well, as of April 11th, the governor declared a state of emergency due to the wildfires, so our EOC is elevated at a level two. Um, which means we're monitoring the situation. At this point, we haven't had any issues with fuel supply or disruption, um, but as these fires continue to burn, if we're not able to um, contain them or if we don't get um, rain, there's the possibility that evacuations would happen. And normally when an evacuation happens, that's when you get a little bit more of the, the fuel crisis or the, the wondering if there will be enough fuel. But right now it has not affected um, any of our fueling infrastructure. But this is just, and you can't really see it, but 
maybe you can if you look online, but this is just a map of where currently the majority of the fires are burning. Um, and right now the state of Florida is, 60% uh, of the state is under a drought. Um, so these fires continue to um, burn, but our Florida Forestry Service is doing their best job to try to contain them. And I will say, um, again, just like the cooperative agreements that the utilities have, um, pr as far as providing uh, services to each other, uh, we have the same when it comes to firefighting. So when the fires were raging out west, a lot of our firefighters from Florida went out there to help them. And I think as of this morning, uh, the state of South Carolina is sending down firefighters um, as well as equipment to help us uh, fight some of these fires. So when we're looking at emergency management, we're not just looking at the one thing you would think of with Florida where it's hurricanes, but we look at all hazards and all natural disasters. And one thing I will say about these fires too is that a lot of them were man-made, meaning folks were outside burning trash or burning something and the fire got out of control and it spread um, to now where we're having this issue with the 205 fires. Um, we also do in Florida have a, um, a Florida Energy Assurance Plan. Um, and like I said, this plan provides guidance on how to respond um, with the loss of electricity, natural gas, or petroleum. Every plan that we do is an all hazards plan. We don't just plan for one, we plan for um, whatever may and could happen. Um, so we do a lot with cybersecurity, we do a lot um, of course with hurricanes, but we also look at any potential other disasters that could occur. Um, so what's ahead for us in Florida? Um, well, hurricane season starts June 1st through November 30th, so we will of course be monitoring that. Um, we will continue to uh, work and monitor the fires that are occurring in the state. Um, I can tell you we just did our yearly hurricane exercise on the week of May 2nd. Um, and what our hurricane exercises do, um, whether it's a hurricane exercise or any other, but this particular one is it, it lets us run through the motions of they give us a scenario of a hurricane has hit this particular area, this is what's happened, and then we respond to it. It allows us to run the scenario so that we can see where our strengths and our weaknesses are, so that we can make adjustments so that when that natural disaster actually happens, we're responding in an efficient um, manner in order to either restore electricity or restore fuel um, to, and provide fuel to all of our constituents across the state. Um, so that is what we do in Florida, and I, th I thank you for, for having us, and I look forward to your questions. I want to say thank you to Kelly, but I must say it is a bit overwhelming to think about what it is that she faces um, in terms of dealing with these kinds of disasters and planning, and particularly um, when it is just part of her job. So now we will turn to Kyla McNabb, who is the Energy Policy Advisor with the Oklahoma Energy Office. As part of her day-to-day -day work, she manages and oversees multiple revolving loan fund programs spanning alternative fuels and energy efficiency, as well as grant-funded programs for clean cities, energy assurance planning, and other energy efficiency, renewable energy, and alternative fuel efforts. She is also a resource for renewable energy policy and technology development in the state. And prior to her role with the Energy Office, she was with the Oklahoma Wind Power Initiative, uh, a collaborative research group and for which she has actually won all sorts of recognition in terms of her leadership. So Kyla, welcome. Thank you. Well, that's a tough act to follow, even though we all deal with our disasters uh, individually in, our, in each of our regions. So as we talked about, we're, each of our regions provide different elements. Um, hopefully today I'll be able to give you a perspective from Oklahoma and, and what we deal with specifically um, with severe weather outbreaks and the role that our energy office plays. So our, ener our state energy office, uh, you're looking at it. Um, <laughs> we are located within our cabinet secretary of energy and environments office. I am the sole full-time staff person involved with some support, administrative support from a sister agency that helps me manage my funding levels. 
Um, but we operate purely on uh, the appropriated state energy program funding out of our office. We receive no additional state resources for what we do, no additional state funding. So uh, the state energy program funding is very key to the actions and efforts that we do within the state of Oklahoma. Um, we see ourselves primarily as the convener of the stakeholders and the resources and holding a lot of the institutional knowledge and technical knowledge to be able to tie people together. We like bringing people to the table, um, forming those relationships, forming those friendships, pulling together the municipals, the cooperatives, the investor-owned utilities, the natural gas operators, the liquid fuels. We have a unique ability within our cabinet secretary's office to pull on each of those different sectors and pull those people to the table um, with, our, with the relationships that we have with them. So our energy assurance plan uh, within the state of Oklahoma is actually primarily a guide, more so than the actual uh, plan within the state. Uh, it complements our state emergency operations plan. Again, we have the coordination efforts across both the federal and state and local jurisdictions. Uh, we often have the ties in through the federal agencies, be it Department of Energy, be it FEMA, to be able to let, get, the, the, get the correct folks talking to each other uh, within the room. Specifically in Oklahoma, we know disasters are going to happen. All of us sitting here at the table uh, and looking at things. Uh, we have the third most disaster declarations within the nation and the other two are sitting right here next to me. <laughs> so uh, we know disasters are going to happen. Uh, it's about what are we going to do when they happen. And this role, I think what's really unique is how it is evolving. I, none of us probably considered cyber attacks as part of energy assurance as little as five years ago. And now it's prime central for uh, for what we need to be considering to keep energy services as normal. For us in Oklahoma specifically as well, you might have heard we have a little bit of an earthquake problem. Uh, not necessarily a problem anymore. They are coming down. And, but this is a new area, again, as our original energy assurance plan was drafted uh, in the 2010-2011 timeframes, we did not account for earthquakes in Oklahoma because they were not happening then. We are not California. We do not have major fault lines. Uh, but the minor earthquakes that have uh, taken place within the state, we do have some considerations. I really can't stress enough either, without our Department of Energy, State Energy Program funding, energy assurance would not take place within the state of Oklahoma. Uh, again, I'm representative of one of the smaller entities and the smaller state energy offices within uh, the United States, and, and we literally, we just couldn't do it without this funding support. It wouldn't happen. So, as I mentioned before, we are no stranger to natural disasters, be it tornadoes, ice storms, wind events uh, taking place. We know from each new disaster that occurs, we have to take away lessons learned because we know the same situation is going to happen again in Oklahoma. Our considerations range from populations to electricity concerns to the Cushing Crude Oil Hub. Um, Cushing is what sets the West Texas Intermediate Crude spot price and it's located in the north central part of the state of Oklahoma. Uh, according to EIA data from last week, it holds 66 million uh, barrels of oil uh, in their tank facilities, as you can see in the picture here. So we have to make sure this infrastructure is protected, uh, not just for the state of Oklahoma, but it has those overreaching national implications as well. So it's our role within the State Energy Office to coordinate those communications activities. Um, as Kelly mentioned, we do not actually hold the ESF-12 operations elements, but we are in communication with those folks over our utility commission that do to make sure that they are getting the correct information, that they are making those correct connections across those industries, that if there's a pipeline company, if there's a utility company that's being a little bit difficult and not sharing information, we're able to step in and open those lines of communication to make sure information is flowing freely. So as I said, Oklahoma City is no stranger to tornadoes. Uh, this is a map showing the Oklahoma City uh, metro area uh, within this yellow, and every single line represents a tornado track that has happened since 1880 within this. 
to give you a sense, so Oklahoma City is directly in the middle of the map, which is directly the center point of the state of Oklahoma. Within these boundaries, there's approximately one million people that live within this, including myself. I am a resident of the city of Moore, which is on the southern end of this map. So about where those blue lines kind of converge. Uh, we are a suburb of Oklahoma City of approximately 50,000 people within the state. Um, what I'm gonna showcase here for you shortly is uh, from an event that took place. We had a major F5 tornado come through my city of Moore, May 20th of 2013. So an F5 tornado means winds of over 300 miles an hour in a mile wide path of destruction that took place. So what, this has been our most recent, recent major catastrophic disaster that we were able to take away several lessons learned from this. And again, it's a bit personal to me just because I lived in the town at the time. My son's daycare was hit by this tornado when he was two and a half. And I can count, it's beyond my 10 fingers and toes, how many friends that lost homes and were personally affected by it. And it gets to be this time of year and this is what's key on our minds as we uh, come up to this time in May. So an actual count of the tornadoes within there is 162, if you'd actually like to know <laughs> a number. During the May 20th tornado within the city of Moore, so again, a population of about 50,000 people, we had over 1,100 homes destroyed or completely uh, or damaged. We also had the major hospital within the area, um, a farm, multiple commercial buildings uh, resulting in, again, this was just in 2013, it was over $2 billion in damage just to our small town. So I know it's not quite the numbers as like a hurricane, but when you talk about condensing that into literally a localized population, uh, the impacts are great. So what we do as far as our energy assurance plan and making sure communications get set forth are key. And so what we wanted to take a look at are what are the energy efficiency opportunities following the storm? Again, we know, <laughs> it's no joke by that map, we're going to get hit by a tornado in Oklahoma again. It's going to happen. But these also relay across uh, disasters. So what we found in rebuilding following the storm is that it provides an excellent opportunity to install energy efficiency and look at code improvements. So there's both short, well there's short, medium, and long-term elements that you can look at. Everything from taking a look at what you can do with storm debris to working with your big box stores for minor repairs. In case you guys didn't know, um, I'm sure Florida is the same way, a lot of times with your big box stores, um, their local staff is put on leave whenever storms like this occur because most often every single person has been affected by the storm. So Home Depot, Lowe's, your big box stores actually bring in staff from other states to man the stores that are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that your minor repair folks, folks that just have windows blown out, fencing down, some minor roof repairs that need to be done so that they can get access to the materials. This is a perfect opportunity when you have to replace your windows, go get the most energy efficient ones. You can come get them off the shelf oftentimes now with the wonderful products that are available out there. In the medium term, what we're able to do as a state energy office, again, is coordinate these multiple agency efforts. Take a look at what funding we can redirect so that as people are buying new appliances for their homes and other elements, that we can provide them rebates or opportunities so that maybe they take one step up as far as an efficiency measure or and get them the resources available. And then the long term, I, I also put in home rebuilding into this because it is a process. As I drive, as I will drive tomorrow to go drop my daughter off at daycare, there are still five home lots that are nearby her daycare that are just still cleared because they haven't rebuilt their house yet. Now most of them it's because frankly they've left, <laughs> um, but they're still in the process of rebuilding some homes. Again, this is another opportunity. You have an opportunity to work with home builders and others in the area to ensure that the homes that they're building are the most efficient possible because efficiency means resiliency. This is what we have learned and I think any one of us sitting here at the table can tell you that from experience. So to give you an example, a photo example of why efficiency means resiliency, 
This is an aerial photo that was taken place during um, the survey that took place following uh, the May 20th tornado that came through um, our town. They took a look at several different structures to identify, okay, how were buildings built? How did they hold up? Because this is going to be the monster of all monster storms. This is going to be the ultimate test of structures and facilities. What you have here is a neighborhood that was built by a traditional large home builder within the area that builds all their homes to Energy Star specifications. And what this highlights is the box around the EF2 shows that is just somewhat minor damage. So when you talk about EF1, EF2, EF5, what a lot of folks don't understand is that's a rating of how much damage is done by the tornado. So EF5, as you can see on the top there, that's foundation is clear. Literally nothing is left. Everything is swept away because in 300 mile an hour winds, it's very difficult for things to stay put. EF2 damage comes down a couple notches. And so essentially you look at the damage that's done there opposed to clearly an EF4 or an EF5. Homes that are built more efficient are stronger. They have less damage done to them, which means that family does not have to tear down their home. They can have it repaired and continue to live in it. And what's drastic here is the short breadth of distance between that EF5 and that EF2. In a typical scenario, if you have a generally built home that doesn't have these considerations put into place, you're gonna see a great deal more damage in that proximity. So what came of this survey was very similar to what Florida did. The city of Moore, so Oklahoma is a home rule state when it comes to our building codes. So we leave it to our local jurisdictions to be able to um, enforce and, and enact their own building codes. The city of Moore actually looked to Florida uh, as an example of, okay, what can we do to build our homes, homes more resilient and the result of that has been an adoption of new codes that requires, are the garage doors, for instance, have to be rated for 135 mile an hour winds. And when you take a look at what that means to put in such a garage door like that, they're the energy efficient ones. <laughs> they're the double walled with insulation. I know this because I had to put one on my house. And they work beautifully. So again, efficiency means resiliency. So this is what energy assurance means in Oklahoma. It's about recognition of the fact that we know storms are going to happen. We know these attacks are going to happen. What can we learn from them so that we can make sure that coordination is taking place across the state, that communication lines are, correct, are up and able to be done across the state, as well as what can we do following the storm to rebuild and make things the most efficient means possible. Where this crosses over as well is this type of approach. What we're taking is how we can apply these lessons learned to the new areas, to earthquakes and to then to cybersecurity as well. What can we do in the forefront? How can we treat things? How can we bring things back to normal um, as quickly as possible? So thank you for this opportunity today and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks so much, Kyla. S slight lunch pause. Okay, we'll now turn to our um, third presenter from, from States, and that is Michael Furs, who is the director of the Washington Energy Office. And he, um, as part of his overall job, his division strengthens communities throughout the state, um, throughout the Washington State Energy Office's Office through a combination of policy initiatives, emergency energy management efforts, uh, just as all of our other speakers have talked about as well, as well as the low income weatherization program. After spending five years as the New Mexico Mortgage Finance Authority's Green Initiative Manager, he joined Washington State's weatherization program and then became uh, later the director of the Energy Office 
uh, for the state of Washington. And so we are delighted to welcome Michael here. So as Carol mentioned, I moved from Washington State, uh, from um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, up to Washington State. So at the time, I knew I was trading sunshine for rainy days. But I really had no understanding of the, um, of the, of the seismic um, underpinnings of the land that we had moved to. Um, I learned a little bit about it when I showed up to work and there was an emergency preparedness kit that said earthquake readiness at my desk. I had to ask about what that meant. And then there was a New Yorker article that you might have heard about from 2015, which my wife found first and asked me a lot of pointed questions about. And so from that point forward, our house was a little bit more prepared and the work that we're doing with, uh, as the ESF-12 lead for the state of Washington took on um, a greater focus. So as was mentioned, commerce strengthened communities in Washington. We manage 100 different programs. We're sort of like the Swiss army knife of, uh, of state government. And we've got you know, a problem. If the community has a problem, we've got a program that will solve it. And part of the challenge for emergency planning, unlike the seasonality of uh, tornadoes or hurricanes, there really isn't um, um, seasonality for the earthquake that we're trying to prepare for. And so we get into the situation where there's not a constituency for the problem that we're trying to solve, which makes the challenge a little bit more uh, difficult. As you heard from my colleagues, the planning work requires intention. There's a problem. We're going to figure out a way to solve it. Um, iteration. We're going to each year try and do a little bit better and learn from the mistakes and, and find new opportunities. And also funding uh, with partnerships through the Department of Energy's state uh, energy program and with the Office of Electricity, it enabled a lot of the planning that we've been able to do. Partnerships are something that come naturally into the Pacific Northwest. We work with the Bonneville Power Administration, who manages transmission for Montana, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington State. And so we're used to doing that type of coordination, uh, which will be put to the test and during the, the exercise that I'm going to relay to you in a little bit. So I just want to give you a sense of the continuum of things that the Energy Office might deal with. So show of hands, uh, how many folks have lost power in the last month? Last six months? Last year? Okay. So depending on that outage, you know, it can range from a, a minor inconvenience or something you don't even notice up to a, a sort of a severe issue. So just think for a sec. For most of us, you, if you lose power for a second, you're not going to notice. We've got advanced manufacturing folks. If they lose power at the wrong second, they may lose $40,000 of production run, but I think they're an outlier. If you lose it for a minute, you might lose any unsaved work open on your computer at the time. Kelly talked a little bit about losing power for an hour or a few hours and needing generators to provide backup. What happens if you lose power for a day? We had a very fierce storm come through the area a couple of weeks ago, and folks lost power. They missed work. They had to eat their ice cream very quickly. Uh, I had a friend who uh, could not get out of her garage to um, serve some clients. Now, you can just lift your garage up. She'd forgotten that you don't need a clicker to get out of your house. <laughs> but nonetheless, there was economic opportunity that was lost. And you know that generator, what happens if you lose power for a week? How much fuel do you have on hand? And then what about if you lose power for a month or a couple of months? When you talk with folks about this, the first thing that I see flash before their eyes is uh, you know, The Walking Dead or some other zombie uh, show you know, where you, you are just sort of, uh, civilization is broken down to some degree. And so it's that last one where people don't have any real world experience with being without power for a prolonged period of time that really is, is difficult to make connections with folks on. Uh, so I'm gonna answer a couple of questions here. Uh, on the right side here, uh, what is the Cascadia subduction zone? And then um, what was Cascadia rising? So what I learned from that New Yorker article is that there are two plates coming together, represented by that red line. Uh, coming from the west to the east, you've got the Strait of Juan de Fuca that is going underneath the North American plate, buckling up the nice Cascade Mountains. And this pressure builds up and it builds up and it builds up over hundreds of years. And then every 300 to 500 years, it lets go. So the last time this happened was about 1700, and there are oral traditions from the native communities about finding canoes and trees, and more recently there was uh, archaeological evidence that was found, I believe both in Japan, uh, but also in, uh, in the Northwest for, for that event. And as you can imagine, there's been a lot that's changed uh, since the 1700s. We've got Boeing, we've got Microsoft, we've got millions more people living from Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, down to Northern, Colorado, or Northern California. 
So the devastation is going to be that much more severe. The models predict uh, you know, over 1,000 fatalities in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, 1,300 fatalities from the resulting tsunami from a 9.0 or greater earthquake, and then 2,400 uh, people would be injured from there. The, uh, on the right here, you can just see a lot of colored squiggly lines, and that's just to represent two things. One, where we have infrastructure, and two, where that infrastructure would be damaged. I think it's fair to say that an event of this size, folks are not doing planning, um, or have not been doing planning historically for uh, resiliency of, uh, of an event of this size. So what is the ESF-12 responsibility for this? Um, the Cascadia Rising exercise occurred almost a year ago, in June of 2016, and it was a buildup of two years of work, uh, resulting in uh, a multi-day, multi-team, interdisciplinary exercise to test the plans that we had to see how we would uh, do in an event of this magnitude. So our, our responsibility for ESF-12, as you've heard, is to assess the situation, uh, to organize and collect information, to coordinate the response, and to help other people solve problems. And there were four things that we did. Uh, we crafted recommendations for the governor, whether it was an emergency uh, declaration or uh, suspension of regulations. We coordinated situational awareness with, with situational awareness with energy providers. So that's folks in the electrical grid, the utilities, and we've got co-ops and we've got um, municipal utilities and investor-owned utilities to work with. Work with our natural gas stakeholders, and then I'll spend more time talking about uh, the work that we've done coordinating fuels. In addition to that. Uh, we knew that there were going to be fuel shortages in an event like this, so we developed a fuel allocation plan and were able to do that with the help of the Office of Electricity and test that uh, in some, I would say, fairly tense uh, real-world situations or simulated real-world situations. And the last thing we did was coordinate requests for fuel, generators, that sort of thing from, um, from counties. Washington State has uh, an emergency management system, which I think is the worst acronym that I have run across. It's called WASDATS. Um, <laughs> And this is the Washington um, version of, you know, when things go wrong, uh, here's the visual image. So what you're seeing up there is um, electrical outages by service provider. Those are the big colorful swaths. Now you've got yellow lines that represent uh, transmission from the Bonneville Power Administration. And then you've got these green triangles, which are the transmission infrastructure that BPA has. And the color code is designed to give you a sense of how long these outages would take. There are areas that aren't either black or red, and it's not that they are with, um, without power outages, they just um, didn't have them uh, up and running at the time. So the idea is for us to get a sense of how our utilities are doing. We can scrape some of this information from their websites, and uh, in other cases we get a call and pick up information uh, over the phone. And to be able to give this in more or less real time to the members in the, of the State Emergency Operations Center folks that aren't used to dealing with the grid so they can get a sense of where there is, where there is not power as they're coordinating logistics for the emergency response. What this map is showing is um, it's more focused on fuel infrastructure. And uh, so we've got this sort of reddish color on the right and on the opposite side you've got this yellowish color. And the yellow looks great but it's really strong shaking and it gets up to extremely severe shaking. So the expectation is that the a lot of the energy infrastructure, in particular fuel infrastructure, is going to be damaged during this event. So that's uh, refineries, pipelines, et cetera, being damaged to the point of um, you know, possibly explosions, but certainly their operational capacity to help fuel the recovery effort is going to be limited. So it's our responsibility to, um, you know, with that eventuality, we don't have the fuel that we were counting on in maybe a seasonal fire disaster to be able to push out to communities. Um, how do we get fuel from the outside, probably by, um, by ship, into the state, and then set up distribution systems so that first responders and second responders can get out and do the necessary repair work for the grid and for the communities that they're trying to serve? And so what we did was take a first cut at uh, setting up a distribution system where we would put fuel depots. Fuel depo depots would then supply, uh, at one level lower, fuel stations where folks would go with their trucks and machinery to get fuel. And when you've got that situation um, and you know you don't have enough fuel, how do you make choices about who gets to use the fuel? So we set up a credentialing system uh, showing three tiers here. And this was the most tense debate that I was part of in the Cascadia Rising exercise because everyone's emergency was the top priority. And because of the interdependentness that David mentioned, there's a lot going on simultaneously. And how do you tease out a logical structure in real time when you don't have all the information to go through all the steps necessary to restore a community here, a community there, a community there? 
So what you're seeing here is sort of version 2.0. Initially, we had um, different state departments listed under the tiers. And so we got into a kind of a rabbit hole conversation about who, uh, was, who we valued higher as a state agency. And so we've uh, stepped away from that, learned from our mistake, and now we've got these sort of gray tiers so we can get to the heart of the conversation. You know, how do we first get uh, fuel to the first responders, the priority folks, and then how do we build out from there as, as fuel becomes um, more readily available? So there are a couple of things that we learned uh, in the process. Uh, one, our plans, first of all, the planning activity, the exercise was a success because it tested our plans and we found out that some things worked and some things didn't. And where some things didn't work, it's time to go back a little bit to the drawing board and expand our thinking. Um, you know, the tendency is to plan for the disaster you know, and since we didn't know this one, uh, it's sort of hard to, to wrap your minds around what multi-state, multi-jurisdictional coordination of, you know, for example, 1.8 million gallons of fuel distribution within a six-month period might look like. And part of the issue really is um, starting to have conversations with folks. Now that we have this broadened perspective, we can have different conversations with our peers in Oregon, with our peers in Idaho, uh, and even with our peers in Utah and Colorado. Because at some point, if we experience the type of event that is being planned for, it's possible that folks in my shop, myself included, might not be able to show up to work to be able to respond to this disaster. So our plans need to be at such a level that anyone from the Department of Commerce can walk into an office or that we can reach out to folks in Colorado or Utah and ask them to go through our script and sort of devolve our planning so that anyone can take this on and move it forward. Having that conversation with your staff um, is particularly challenging, but it's the, sort of the next place for us to go. The other, the other issue that came up is a, under a typical command and control structure, folks are gonna ask for resources and they get moved up a chain of, of a, an emergency management bureaucracy. And it's likely that that chain will take lots of time to set up. So how do you find ways to push resources out into a community before they ask for it and give them enough information to know how they should be using or could be using those resources? And how do you trust them um, to do the right thing when you're getting political pressure from, um, from, from above you? Uh, so difficult questions. So with that, I'd like to say, one, we've got um, more work to do, and we've had a couple of different events that have uh, come out of the Cascadia Rising. Part of that is the governor has pulled together a resiliency sub-cabinet that's trying to look at ways that we can work with investor-owned utilities and other utilities to identify areas in their infrastructure that uh, are vulnerable to an earthquake and tsunami and prioritize um, some of the upgrades of those facilities. And at the Department of Commerce, we have a, a clean energy fund that the, the governor and legislature set up that kind of starts to nibble at the edges of grid resiliency. And so here are a couple of projects that, while they don't address um, all of what would happen in Cascadia rising, they, they certainly deal with the, um, the, you know, the second outages in an advanced manufacturing situation. And they speak to uh, the lessons that the state needs to learn in order to figure out how to deploy microgrids and uh, a smarter grid as a whole in order to deal with the uh, Cascadia Rising experience uh, when it, whenever it might come. So these are, these are four projects. I, I mentioned this, um, the one on the, uh, on the left side, this Avista Pullman project, is set up in partnership with um, Schweitzer Engineering and the local utility. These are the folks when power would trip off when, um, well, it would trip off frequently on a windy day, happens at the wrong time, uh, they experience this, um, this $40,000 hit to their bottom line. And what they found is that um, with this system, they can switch controls very quickly and uh, provide power um, whenever folks need it. The, the North Star there, which is up in the town of Glacier, is at the end of a very long line of our largest investor-owned utility, Puget Sound Energy. And it, similar situations, windstorms, ice storms, snowstorms, power goes out. These folks are at the end of the line, and this gives them about, the town, about eight hours of power um, in, in the event of one of those emergencies or in a larger one. So as I said, we're just starting to um, experiment and apply and demonstrate technology that we hope can go further in the next few years. And I look forward to uh, answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. And I have to say, I don't know about all of you, but if anybody thinks that being in these jobs is at all boring, and when you look at the responsibilities on their plates to deal with all of this, it's pretty, it's pretty mind-boggling. And again, it's just a piece of what they are doing. 
And I also want to emphasize that over the years, as I have talked to so many state energy directors, they, I have learned over and over again what a critical role the state energy program, which again receives very modest funding from the Department of Energy every year, how critical it is in terms of enabling this very, very important function across each state to really occur and to work in tandem with other federal and other state partners. Um, and so before we open it up for a Q&A, I'd like to ask uh, Jeremy Marcus to come up for a few minutes to talk a little bit about um, a bill that his boss is is working on with other bipartisan members um, in, in an approach to sort of look at how we can do a better job in terms of coordination and dealing with resilience. Jeremy is the Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director for Congressman Matt Cartwright of Pennsylvania. Thanks, Carol. Um, well, this has been really great to be here in Washington and hear about so much important on the ground work, but I want to talk a little bit today about something that we can do in Washington at the federal level um, to help support the work that they're doing and help the federal government also prepare for these events. So back in 2013, the GAO came out with a high-risk report, something they do every Congress, but for the first time in 2013, they put um, the uh, federal government's response to extreme weather events as a point of vulnerability for the federal government. My boss, we worked with GAO um, and in a bipartisan manner to come up with a PREPARE Act. What the PREPARE Act does, um, based on the GAO's recommendation, is three simple things. First, it creates an interagency council to look at federal government-wide preparedness for extreme weather events. The second thing it does is strengthens each individual agency's adaptation plans. And the third thing it does is it works with local and state partners to uh, improve regional coordination and make sure best practices from the local level are both spread around the country and filter up to the federal government. So this is a no-cost plan. A lot of these actions are already underway in the administration, but um, this bill would strengthen those actions um, and expand them, and we think it's important to put them into actual legislation. So this is a no-cost bipartisan bill. We've got almost 60 organizations. We've got the private sector. We've got um, interest groups. We've got um, a lot of companies that are doing this type of work themselves that see the federal government not doing what they need to do to adequately prepare. So um, I just would invite um, anyone here who's from an outside organization who wants to work with us on this bill or anyone from congressional offices. We're planning on reintroducing the bill. We've introduced it on um, the past two Congresses and we're, we're making a strong push this Congress. We'd um, love to continue the support and uh, I'll set up here, and uh, if anyone has any questions about the PREPARE Act, uh, happy to answer them. So thank you. Okay. Okay. All right, so we'll now open it up for your questions and comments. And I thought I saw a hand over here first. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, and if you could identify yourself, please. Okay, Do you want to, could you wait for the microphone? Here we go. Thank you, Denise Rayborn Wickersham consultant, Energy, Environment, Sustainability. Jeremy, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned this bill that's being created, and I heard weatherization, weather responses. Is it also, I just heard something on digitization and emergency responses for the energy sector. Um, does it also include beyond weather to, say, cyber? So the bill concentrates on the effects of all extreme weather events, which we define as any sustained Weather patterns are outside the norm, so that could be anything um, from tornadoes to uh, rising sea levels to hurricanes. Um, so I think that the bill would have to have a nexus to out of the ordinary weather, but it's probably defined in the most broad terms. So um, we don't, it wouldn't have necessarily a focus on cyber in the bill, but I do think some of the instruments that we stand up to look at interagency coordination to prepare for those events could easily be brought in to encapsulate other types of threats that we would face. Okay, um, over here, and then we'll go back over here. Okay. Thanks, uh, Terry Hill with the uh, Emerge Alliance. Um, on one of the slides from Oklahoma, you had EMP. 
um, in this new bill, is EMP going to be, or solar flares, and the impact of, particularly, what are you looking at the role microgrids could play in mitigating EMP or solar flares on the uh, grid? So for the PREPARE Act, broadly speaking, we wouldn't get into the specifics of how agencies to prepare for such an event. But what we would do is force the Department of Energy to come up with a more robust um, extreme weather adaptation plan, which would have to include um, both, their, both what types of threats they face and what their response would be. Um, and in addition, currently there are similar plans that are required, but they're not reported to Congress, and there's really not as much, enough oversight within the federal government. So this, this would require these reports not only to be submitted for evaluation to the interagency council that we put together, but also to be submitted to Congress. So while we wouldn't, the bill does not get into the details of solar flares, but we would be able to see in a much more transparent manner what the Department of Energy is planning for, and we would hope that that would engender some conversation if there are certain areas that are not adequately being planned. Okay, uh, back there and then over here. Thanks very much. My name is Jared Blum. I happen to serve as chair of the EESI, so I want to thank you on behalf of the Board of Directors for your, your efforts to come in here today and explain the difficulty of what you're trying to achieve at the state and local level. My question has to do with the reference all of you made to the issue of planning and to what extent federal, federal assistance, federal research, whether it's national labs, whether it's data retrieval, et cetera, to what extent do you rely on that as part of your planning process? Well, I would say, uh, I would have to check with our emergency operations center. As I said, we're not the primary office that's responsible for that. Um, we just serve as support uh, once that emergency happens and we're activated. Um, but I do think that they work very closely with the federal government when it comes to um, natural disasters and and looking at, at the information that they have available. Um, I think for us in Oklahoma, it, it's important. It's a piece of the puzzle. Um, it, it's definitely required and is something that we look to leverage in the best way possible. So any additional support that we get is certainly welcome. Uh, we do manage things quite well on our own on the ground <laughs> uh, with the experience that we've had, but with that experience also comes in figuring out, okay, where does it make sense to have that partnership? Where are those pieces uh, that we need? Um, where makes sense? Where doesn't make sense? Where can we handle things on our own? So I think that that's an important communication element as well. Yeah, the, the relationships, I think, are key. Everyone shows up with good intentions, uh, but it's about how you put those intentions to use on the ground based on the situational awareness that folks at the local level have that really makes it work or not work. And, you know, I, I'm a relatively new uh, director for the State Energy Office, so it's been nice to be able to go out and meet and introduce myself to my colleagues in other states and also work with federal partners to get a under, better understanding of the perspective that they're bringing so that in the event that they do show up on the doorstep, I know where they're coming from uh, to begin with. Um, you also mentioned the National Lab, so I think uh, we're fortunate in Washington to have the Pacific Northwest National Lab. I know that they've been doing work on um, cybersecurity preparedness and working with utilities in our state, and so there's a, a white paper that I think we're waiting uh, to see at this point. I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's come out yet or not, uh, but they, they've got um, high-powered folks that do a lot of deep thinking, uh, and so it's great to be able to connect them with our utilities and see um, how to connect the dots from the, the research perspective that they've got to the engineering and sort of on-the-ground perspective. Um, and sometimes that does require a little bit of crosswalk, but it's, it's good discussion. Okay, and I know that a lot of places also depend a lot upon information coming out of NOAA and, and other agencies as a way to buttress your uh, all of your your efforts within state too. Okay, back back here in the back first. If you could, and then we'll. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Rachel Carrillo, and I am a volunteer leader with the Climate Reality Project, as well as on the board of United Nations Association of Boulder County. We're kind of the epicenter of climate research and certainly not, um, and weather research, and no strangers to flood and, and drought and 
a lot of climate events that um, have uh, necessitated our our uh, resiliency planning. So I have um, two, uh, a, one question for both of the coastal folks, um, and then one for Oklahoma. Um, so uh, you, uh, Kelly, you mentioned solar uh, for the shelters with kind of a limited capacity for, um, for uh, I guess, generation, and um, the nearly $1 million that's been um, uh, I guess put forward by the, the uh, investor-owned utilities saying how successful these programs are. Is there anything on um, either in Florida or in Washington state that has to do with wave energy or even offshore wind that's tying into that? And then the, my, my second question for both of you is if, the, um, if any of the private sector, for example in Cascadia, <laughs> uh, rising, if private sector um, relief efforts are, are, are part of the resiliency planning, like through Amazon, using drones to make deliveries of emergency f food or water. And then for Oklahoma, I, I didn't hear much about wind, so wind again in terms of um, powering operations and uh, if you could possibly speak to earthquakes that, that are resulting from fracking and how that may affect your, uh, your resiliency planning. Thank you. Well, I'll start first. Um, in Florida, we really don't have a lot of compa capacity for uh, wind. Uh, surprisingly enough, it's just there's not enough in our state to be consistent. Um, we do have a University of Florida, Atlantic University, that is working on um, an underwater turbine, um, off in the jet stream, to see if we can uh, pull uh, power from that. Um, they've been working on that research for several years. Um, they've also partnered with a lot of private companies to test different types of systems to see how those would work. Um, but that's really, uh, other than solar, which I think is our primary renewable energy source, um, that's another one that we're looking for, that offshore um, underwater energy. So in Washington, um, I think th there's been ish interest on the coast for, for tidal energy, for wave energy. Uh, there are some transmission hurdles that really prevent it from being economically viable at this time, is my understanding. Um, we do have a couple of startups that are trying to do interesting work in that space. A couple have gotten funding both from the state and from the Department of Energy to pursue um, their technology. Yeah, so it remains to be seen, you know, at what point, we've got very low cost power, uh, we're predominantly a hydro state, so the, the, the economics are gonna have to work out for that to be viable. You know, in terms of interesting ideas for um, gathering situational awareness, uh, drones did not come up in the exercise. Um, as I mentioned, I think other people uh, have talked about as well, you kind of plan for the disaster that you know and build from there. So um, that really wasn't in the toolkit, so to speak, uh, for the, the utilities and the folks that we were working with. We're gonna spend probably uh, a good portion of the next two years doing this work across all of the emergency support functions to figure out where we need to go, and, and I can see in all of the above strategy, you know, any resources that can be put into play, we'll figure out a way to, to make them work. Um, it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what role, if any, drones will play in that. I would add something to that. I, you know, it's been 10 years since we had storms in Florida, and we had two this year, um, and they were pretty close to each other. But the use of social media, I think had an impact um, for our citizenry, especially as it became to power outages. Um, the utilities, uh, I know mine in particular, when Hurricane Hermine came through, I was without power for two days, two and a half days. And the, through Facebook, I was able to look and see, or my utility, which I'm in a co-op, would post where they were doing, what they were doing, what their outage numbers were, how many had been restored, um, what their time frame was, if there were issues with reporting, they would use that social media to help get the information out. Um, so while it wasn't a drone delivering supplies or anything, I think that became very critical, both in Hurricane Hermine and Hurricane Matthew, for citizens to know what was going on when they don't have access to um, TV or radio or wherever they might be. It became a very important information tool, not just for the citizenry, but for us um, at the emergency management level because we could see in real time um, what was happening out there. 
and quickly to Oklahoma, so thank you for not letting me feel forgotten. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, interestingly enough, when it comes to drones, we actually have our electric utility operators using drones to check lines after storms. It's a new um, area for unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, UAVs, that they do consider it. And so we have several cooperatives starting to utilize that now. Um, they're also using it in um, hardening exercises because by using drones, they're able to GIS map where their poles and lines are and know more accurately where things are without the manpower. Um, and, and with regards to wind, yes, it's in our state song, so we have a lot of wind in Oklahoma. It does uh, account for 25% of our utility usage within the state. And that in general, just a, just a large energy mix between renewables, wind for Oklahoma, natural gas, and then some little bit of coal that comes in, that's the energy security uh, within our integrated market. And uh, to the earthquake piece regarding um, earthquakes from injection wells, uh, it, it's a new piece. It's something that was not, again, it was not taking place originally when our original plan was um, uh, created. So we're, we're working to see in our future tabletop exercises what it means and what the possibilities is as we learn more and more data about, uh, about the earthquake situation within Oklahoma. Kelly, you want to One thing I want to add too, I'm sorry, Kyla, just reminded me of it. Um, the Florida Building Commission actually um, went out and did a contract with the University of Florida to do a study on the damage after Hurricane Matthew. And they ended up using drones um, to fly over to look and assess what damage had happened to houses. Um, a lot of those areas were in evacuation areas, so you couldn't get in physically, but they were able to send the drones in to look and see um, where that damage was and what type of damage um, had happened. Um, so it, there is use being made of those to assess it in those areas where you can't get in yet because it's still um, cordoned off. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay, here, and then we'll take over here. Can you get Lori Just Lori Tim Yes. Okay. Um, so Ted Koppel in his book Lights Out really highlights an issue of um, the vulnerability of our 250 transformers at that level, either to cyber attack or EMP or a nuclear um, explosion 250 miles above the... Um, and he also um, mentioned how woefully lacking the uh, response or um, not at the level of what this means for, you know, our um, grids going out on a regional basis. And we're here in Congress, and there's been attempts by some physicists to say for the funding of a, a stealth bomber, you could harden these um, 250 transformers, which would be extremely hard and very lengthy to repair and replace. Okay, so you're just asking about Re yeah. plans in Re terms of dealing with the hardening of transformers in terms of the whole grid. Right. Okay. And actually, one thing I would just mention to you there, um, it turns out on the 25th of this month, May 25th, we will be doing a day-long seminar looking at grid modernization and transmission issues. So that might be a very good opportunity for you to actually get a little bit more information about that very topic. Did any of you want to respond? So that's an issue that comes up in discussion with our emergency management folks in the military department in Washington. Uh, as best I can tell, there's not a great solution for it. Um, I, you know, not hearing the testimony of the, the folks that you mentioned, it's tough to scrape together the cash in the state of Washington to pay for, uh, for something of that, that cost. Um, but I know that it's an area of interest for, for a lot of people. Okay. Um, we'll take these two and then over here. Uh, Tom Horner with Water Management. I'm curious how much coordination there's been with the water authorities and the wastewater authorities, and also if you've looked at backup water for some of the critical facilities. I think, um, as I said, we have two EFF, ESF-12s, they're split, ours is fuel, which we concentrate on, and then the other side is energy. And I know that they work with, with all the utilities on that, and I believe that there's a separate ESF-12 or an ESF-4 wastewater and water 
Um, so I think that they would coordinate those those activities. But I, I think any time there is a disaster, any type of critical infrastructure is going to have to be at the table um, in order to have those conversations about how we keep either water flowing or those utilities still moving in order to provide for our citizenry. Yeah, and, and similar, um, the way we're looking at it, so we're trying to coordinate our efforts. Uh, there's another federal program, the Community Development Block Grant, the CDBG program, that oftentimes provides funding for municipalities to upgrade their wastewater facilities. We find that's also an excellent opportunity for efficiency and renewables, very similar to what Florida did with their solar program with the school. Um, under our funding, actually, out of the state energy program, we actually funded um, a, a wind turbine for one of the municipalities on the northern side of town uh, for their wastewater treatment operations, and they love it and are looking to complement it with solar. So, again, we see that as another opportunity to make the systems as efficient as possible um, so that when they come back online, it, it doesn't take necessarily as much effort, but also see it as a prime opportunity for renewables installation. In Washington, like, as I mentioned, the Department of Commerce runs a bunch of different programs. We're trying to find ways to braid those programs together, and one of those ways is around community resiliency. So we're starting to have conversations with communities so that they can help us to identify those areas, and we can pull funding like CDBG uh, to be able to develop that type of work. But it's an opportunity, I think, at this point for us to continue to pursue. So a lot of communities are looking at more and more ways to do some distributed generation to get systems back up to at least a minimal level so that you can deal with really, really critical things like wastewater uh, treatment facilities. Okay, over here. Hello, I uh, believe it was um, Advisor McNabb from Oklahoma mentioned that uh, some of the more efficient homes tend to be the most resilient in case of a uh, natural disaster and they also mm -hmm. tend to uh, have the uh, least amount of damage during a disaster. And I was wondering, does that also apply to things such as grids and to, uh, and to generators where the more efficient ones are also more resilient and more, uh, and are more, sustain less damage during disasters? From a grid scenario, it's difficult. Like when you're actually talking about power lines, of course metal poles are stronger than wooden poles. And so from a resiliency standpoint, those is what we look to have installed and what they try to do. Those aren't necessarily more efficient because they don't serve an energy efficiency purpose. Uh, but but on-site generators do make a difference. Um, hospitals, your critical infrastructure facilities, for instance, when um, the, the more hospital was hit, uh, it, it, com it wasn't completely wiped out. It was a very large building, naturally. Uh, but when you're talking about grid services down, um, an MRI machine needs to have power to it or it explodes because of, the, because of the, how the batteries are made up and how the magnets and chemicals are made up. So when you have an F5 tornado come through and you have no power lines or any other abilities with, for a couple miles around, how do you handle that besides a gas generator uh, sitting on plant? I think those are efficiency opportunities because natural gas generators, for instance, they would be able to quickly bring those services back up um, in the case of an emergency for critical facility services. So generators do play a good part. Okay, over here. Richard Hoy, I'm a retired firefighter and uh, local CERT member uh, now. The uh, earlier question about water and, uh, and uh, sewer as being a, a, a component of the grid, uh, I think was a very appropriate uh, ask here. And uh, I see the, the um, siloing of the, uh, uh, of the uh, industries that uh, utilize our rights of way, our, that, that develop a grid. Uh, as a potential solution as well as a part of the problem. And I'd like your comment on that. Uh, uh, a um, super authority uh, overseeing all uh, uses of the public lands and private lands that uh, our utilities use uh, might make a, a more rational approach and a more sustainable approach uh, in times of disaster uh, toward the uh, toward the development of the uh, infrastructure. And uh, maybe you could comment on that. Um, my first reaction to that is that it seems like an interesting conversation starter. Um, the, the political 
will and capital necessary to generate that type of a shift to, uh, in Washington at least seems like um, like a, a significant challenge uh, just to, to having those conversations. So, um, but I'm contrasting that with, you know, what I would imagine would be the, the governor's directive to solve the problems in the event of the Cascadia rising exercise. So I think that the shorter term solution that we've got is to, is to set up conversations between the disparate groups or the potentially disparate groups, uh, both at the state level and then at the community level so that folks have got a better understanding of what's going on. Um, that's probably where I would start with that problem from where I sit. Can I can I follow up with this? Um, okay, quick. One one fact that uh, that caught my mind in in this in this area is the uh, data from the um, U.S. Forest Service that uh, one third of the lumber production that is uh, 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 claimed from forest land uh, could be supplied by uh, urban hardwood that is felled during utility exercises. Uh, so with that, uh, with that fact in mind, I see the pathways for utility rights of way as a aggregated, a very large area, and that can supply multitudes of uh, services if, uh, if looked upon in an aggregate, which uh, we don't do with our, with our uh, traditions. Okay. Thank you. And we'll take one last question right back here. Okay. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you to all of you for the very interesting discussion. My name is Katie. I work with Nathan Associates. We're an economics infrastructure consulting firm here. And I had a few questions for all of you. First was, if you have the opportunity to shape your state project pipelines in terms of new energy that's being constructed? And if so, and considering resiliency as being an energy mix, as Kyla had mentioned, and also that there's limited budget constraints in terms of the public sector, is if you have been considering in the future project pipelines leveraging private sector through true PPPs, and if you haven't, if what would be the constraints to that? wants to go first? You're, you're so probably all notes up here. <laughs> yeah. I was expecting a whole bunch more questions. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. so, uh, so I mentioned the Clean Energy Fund in Washington State, and so that is a public-private partnership with utilities. It's something that we have, uh, we've been doing for the last four years at this point and hoping to continue into the future. Um, you know, we do a lot of work in grid modernization. Our folks are um, like sort of, they're getting to the place where they're on par with California, Hawaii, Nevada, uh, Nevada, California, Hawaii, New York, um, in terms of the complexity of what they're trying to do, and we're trying to do it in this low cost and low carbon environment. So uh, it's difficult for us to uh, just sort of make the economics work. Uh, that said, we're starting a conversation with uh, the utilities in the state around um, you know, wh whether or not the grid is ready for the highly electrified future that's going to come in Washington State. And, and that's really our, our way to get in. And, and so w whether or not it'll be additional public-private partnerships, because I can't imagine us getting, you know, a, a um, doubling, tripling, or a tenfold increase in the amount of, of funding that's available for our Clean Energy Fund. Um, you know, how do they prioritize their work so that they can pick off the most vital infrastructure and, and prioritize that using the lessons learned from um, what our other utilities are doing right now with our Clean Energy Fund? Yeah, I think it's I think it's an interesting concept, and you know, with Michael bringing up economics, Oklahoma has the cheapest overall power in the nation. I and mean, we're talking our retail uh, power to my house is ten cents a kilowatt hour. It makes a lot of things difficult to do, <laughs> and so which I greatly enjoy. I am not complaining about that. Neither are our citizens, um, nor our businesses. And so when we take a look at the energy mix, it needs to be right. Um, I definitely think there would be a role and an opportunity for public-private partnerships. Uh, we do have a situation, uh, the Clean Line Energy Company. So Clean Line is looking to build a large-scale transmission line that would take renewable energy from the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles to Tennessee to serve their needs. And there will also be capabilities beyond renewables as well, I, I hear, beyond, on that line. So those opportunities are taking place. Um, and I, I think it's an area to definitely look into. I would uh, agree with Kyla. In Florida, we have 
fairly low energy rates as well. I think we're at 13 cents per kilowatt. So it does make investment in some renewables uh, difficult. I will say um, our utilities submit a 10-year site plan um, to the utilities, and that's the information that they use to see what the utilities are planning on bringing online. Um, within the next 10 years, a lot of our utilities um, have started to look at more community solar projects, um, installing the solar themselves as opposed to um, consumers putting it on their, their rooftops. Um, so they're, they're moving in, in that direction, more community solar, and I think pretty much all of our um, investor-owned utilities as well as our two largest municipalities have all invested in some program like that. Um, we, we don't oversee that new energy pipeline, um, but we always are looking for ways to partner um, with our utilities or with the public or private sector to see how we can diversify our portfolio. Um, in Florida, we're about 67% natural gas, and so that diversification is, is important for reliable, stable power to our state. Um, so we're, we're always looking at it, but I don't think we've seen anything yet, a, a program that we can, that we've been able to move forward. Okay, I would like to ask you to join me in thanking this terrific panel. And, and I would just like to say I am very uh, appreciative of the whole partnership and the long-term relationship that we have with NASIO and therefore with, with all of you. And really look forward to working with you in the future. And, and I hope that we all have gained a new appreciation for all of the things that are put on these folks' um, screens that, that have to be dealt with. It, and, and an appreciation by all of us in terms of how many things there are in terms of thinking about overall infrastructure that are so interconnected and upon which we are all so dependent. And therefore, it means that we all have a real responsibility to look at things in a very holistic way to really try and problem solve because it has a very basic impact upon our economies at the state level, but that all affects our national economy and how we run, and has a very, very huge effect upon all of our people um, in every state and locality. So thank you all for being here, really appreciate it. And we have a briefing coming up on May 15th that is going to be taking a look at renewable uh, natural gas and, and also, uh, 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 biogas and and how waste can become resources and then of course uh, on May 25th we'll be looking at transmission and grid modernization again so and we will be doing more in this whole series on uh, infrastructure uh, with the states and with the national labs so we thank you for your participation and feel free to contact us with ideas and reaction and thank you all so very very much <laughs> <laughs>